Hello, and thank you for joining us on Axe's official YouTube channel. My name is Michael Birch, and I'm Axe Gay Men's Community Educator and Resource Coordinator. What you're about to watch is an edited Community Health Forum recorded on March 31st about the topic of cancer. Please be mindful that any information presented here is only as current as of that date. As a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, Axe has gone digital, and we are now offering our Community Health Forum series online via Zoom webinar. For more information about how you can watch our forums live, to suggest a future topic, give feedback, or ask questions, email me at mbirch at actoronto.org. As always, ACT would like to thank our sponsors, Vive Healthcare, Merck, Gilead, and the Village Farms. Without their generous support, we could not bring you these forums. I would also like to thank our presenters. Lastly, for up-to-date information about ACT and our programming, please visit us online at www.actoronto.org or on any of our numerous socials. Thank you, enjoy this presentation, and don't forget to comment and subscribe below. So before we begin uh, formally, I'm just gonna start with a land acknowledgement and a PH acknowledgement. I wanna recognize that um, some of you might be joining us from uh, out of the city or even out of the province. So this uh, forum is being broadcast from uh, Toronto. Um, so this land acknowledgement is uh, specific to that. As many of us are settlers on this land, it is our collective responsibility to pay respect and recognize that this land is the traditional territory of the Mississauga of the New Credits First Nations, and we are here because this land was occupied. It is our collective responsibility to recognize our colonial histories and present day implications and to honor, protect, and sustain this land. And now I'm going to read our PHA acknowledgement. Also central to the successes we have achieved has been the greater involvement and meaningful engagement of people living with HIV who continue to share their lives, experiences, and passion in the fight against HIV. We are indebted to the millions of people living with HIV from our past, our present, and our future. Um, so with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Joanne Lindsay and allow her to introduce our special guest. Thank you so much, Michael, and welcome everybody. I'm excited to be here with you and to introduce you to Iwana. Nikolai, who I've been working with at uh, St. Mike's Hospital for a couple of years now. We're both members of the Estimate Lab led by Dr. Ann Birchall. And this particular study that we've been working on is related to the burden of cancer for those living with HIV in Ontario. Um, Iwana will uh, be doing much of the presentation, but uh, um, I'm uh, just uh, going to get things started a little bit. So the study is called The Burden of Cancer Among People Living with HIV in Ontario. We want to talk um, about the work. <laughs> we want to give you some background and talk about some of our methods and uh, data. Juana is not just a researcher at uh, the um, uh, Estimate Lab at uh, St. Mike's Hospital. Uh, Center for Urban Health Solutions at Unity Health Toronto, um, uh, but she's also a PhD student in epidemiology at the University of Toronto, and I look forward to, uh, you know, the time when we can call her doctor. <laughs> Upcoming, <laughs> I mean, we. I think I think she'll she she'll need another uh, another bit of time. I'm not sure how much, but um, and my name is Joanne Lindsay. I know. Um, I've been at, uh, at the Ramada many times for these community health forums. Uh, so uh, those of you who do attend regularly will, will probably have seen me there. And uh, I, um, <coughs> I'm a community investigator uh, with the Estimate Lab at, um, at St. Mike's Hospital. This study is called CARE HIV, Cancer Burden Among People Living with HIV and the role of engagement in HIV care in reducing cancer risk. So these are the steps in this study. Um, we're starting out with step one, what is the burden of cancer among people with HIV? The objective in this area is to calculate the number of new cancer cases, which is incidence um, rate, and the number of existing cancer cases prevalence among people living with HIV in Ontario. Step two, are people with HIV at greater risk of cancer than the general population? 
And the objective here is to compare the risk of cancer among people with HIV to the general population of Ontario. And step three, can better engagement in HIV care be a way to reduce the risk of cancer? And here the objectives are to examine whether immune function measured by CD4 counts is associated with cancer risk and another objective to explore various definitions of engagement in care as possible pathways to reduce cancer risk. So, you know, as always, we're looking to uh, find ways to uh, in, uh, enhance the health of those people living with HIV. Okay, so I'm going to pass things over to Iwana to uh, take us on this uh, journey for the next 40 minutes or so. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, please let me know if you have trouble seeing the slides or if you have trouble hearing me. Um, I do have a dog, so you might hear barking at one point in the background. So I'm, I apologize for that in advance. Um, so thank you. I'm so grateful to be here. This is my first time presenting an act, so I'm a bit nervous. Um, as Joanne uh, shared with you, this is my entire PhD journey. And for today, so right now we have results from the step one, um, which is really laying the foundation and um, estimating the burden of cancer in Ontario. Um, so step two and three are upcoming and um, stay tuned. I'd love to come back if it's of interest and present the following, um, the results from the next two studies. Uh, but right now we only have results for step one. Um, so just wanna start off with um, thanking, sorry, <laughs> thanking, um, uh, everyone who's collaborated, um, as first and foremost, people living with HIV, just acknowledge the contribution. Uh, my, uh, my supervisor, Dr. Ann Virgil, who is also the principal investigator of the, the study, the care HIV study, um, all the co-investigators, and Joanne has been um, a co-investigator from the very beginning and really helping me every step of the way, um, as have um, the, my community advisory board members. Um, they've been instrumental and in really being there every step of my journey and helping me um, with um, uh, putting the results into context and really helping uh, uh, me being able to better present my results. And of course, all of my um, all of the partners in the Estimate Lab and my teammates um, at St. Michael's Hospital. And also acknowledge uh, that this study is funded by the Ontario HIV Treatment Network. And we're very lucky, lucky and fortunate to have a lot of uh, partners and collaborators and stakeholders um, that will help uh, hopefully um, promote the, the findings of the study. So I'm going to give you a bit of a background and then talk about the methods, um, share the preliminary findings, and then um, just some takeaway messages and open it up for discussion. So cancer is becoming an important comorbidity among people uh, living with HIV. <clears throat> and there are many factors um, that lead to this. Uh, one of them is because of the introduction of antiretroviral therapy, there's increased longevity. So people are now aging with HIV um, and risk is uh, now there is a higher risk of cancer um, because age is an important risk factor. Um, HIV itself is classified as an oncogenic virus, which means it has the potential to cause cancer. And it was classified by the International Agency for Research on Cancer. So this agency is part of the World Health Organization, and it's really the um, agency focused on cancer research. So one of their mandates is to look at all the scientific literature that's out there, compile it, and um, really focus in on what are the um, major cancer risk factors. Uh, there's also the role of immune function. So if there's a, a low immune function, that means that there's the potential of decreased surveillance by the immune system, uh, which means that the immune system is less able to um, 
catch early precancerous cells, or even um, there could be the persistence of other cancer-causing viruses. And lastly, there are known cancer risk factors um, that could be more prevalent, such as tobacco and alcohol use. And some studies have shown higher prevalence of other oncogenic viruses um, among people with HIV, such as human papillomavirus um, and hepatitis B or hepatitis C virus. So just going over some definitions, so um, a lot of studies are using these definitions um, to classify cancers among people with HIV. So we have AIDS-defining cancers and non-AIDS-defining cancers. Uh, AIDS-defining cancers include cervical cancer, Kaposi sarcoma, and non-Hodgkin lymphoma, all of which have um, are related to an infectious agent. Um, and then we have non-infectious, non-AIDS-defining cancers which can also be divided into infection related and infection unrelated. And I can spend more time in the discussion going over this classification, but I just wanted to introduce it now because we are using it um, in our study just to be able to compare with what other studies have shown. So what is in the literature? So there are a lot of studies from the US and Europe uh, that have shown that there is two times higher risk of non ace defining cancers in the combination ART era um, compared to before the introduction of ART. There's also an increase in the risk of infection related non ace defining cancers. Uh, there's a higher risk of cancer among people with HIV than the general population. And studies have also shown a large decrease in the risk of AIDS defining cancers. So here just showing you data from the US. Um, on the left, there, you see that there's a decrease in the number of AIDS defining cancers since 1996. Uh, up to 2010. And on the right panel, you see that there seems to be an increase in the number of new uh, cases of non AIDS defining cancers over time. Um, not all of them, but uh, certain types of them. Uh, but there are very few studies from Canada and mostly uh, most of the studies are coming from British Columbia and there are uh, no studies so far from Ontario, which is why um, we wanted to look at what is the burden of cancer among people with HIV in Ontario. So for this, we had several questions that we were interested in answering. So first we wanted to know how many cancers are diagnosed. And then we wanted to look at how many are infection related and how many are infection unrelated. Then we were wondering what are the most common cancers overall and also among males and females? And what are the cancer trends over time? And how do these cancer trends compare to Ontario and Canadian cancer statistics from the general population? So for our data, we used um, secondary data that's already been collected. So here I'm showing the different types of data that we use. So we had data from electronic medical charts. We had uh, data from the Ontario Cancer Registry. Uh, we used OHIB physician billing data, and we also used a um, previously validated algorithm used to identify individuals with HIV in secondary data sets. So we didn't um, have data from, we didn't conduct a study to collect data. We used existing studies, uh, existing data. So all of this data is held in a secure location and with uh, restricted access. Um, in fact, I there was a, a very extensive process for um, to be able to get approval to access this data, and I'm the only one that is, um, is approved to analyze the data. Uh, the, all of the data is anonymous, and there is um, no personal identifying information. Um, all the personal identifying information was replaced with a confidential code, and we use this code to be able to link multiple data sources. So, for instance, um, data from medical charts with data from the Ontario Cancer Registry. 
and uh, the data that I present are always presented at group level. So there's never a worry about being able to identify um, individuals. So we created a, a cohort of individuals using the HIV algorithm, and we followed individuals from 1997 to 2018. So that was the length of our study period. So now I'm going to jump into the results. So overall, during uh, we identified 17,576 people with HIV in Ontario. The majority, so 78%, were male and 22% were female. Most of individuals, uh, when they entered the cohort, were in their 30s or 40s, and the median age was 37. Um, about two thirds of individuals were Canadian born and one third were immigrant born. And about half of the individuals who are immigrant born were born in a country with a generalized HIV epidemic. 96% uh, of individuals lived in urban cities and 62% had a moderate to high comorbidity burden at study entry, so when they entered the cohort. And on average, an individual was followed up for nine years. So how many cancers were diagnosed? So during the study period, so from 1997 to 2018, we found that there were 1,127 cancer diagnoses. 19% of these cancers were diagnosed among females and 81% were diagnosed among males. Now, if we look at um, the groupings of cancers, we found that about half of the cancers were infection unrelated cancers and about half were infection related. And um, if we further look into the infection related cancers, um, we found that 29% were ACE defining cancers and 24% were infection-related non-AIDS defining cancers. Okay, so what were the most common cancers that we found? So the top 10 most common cancers were non-Hodgkin lymphoma, Kaposi sarcoma, prostate, lung, anal, colorectal, oral pharyngeal, liver, Hodgkin lymphoma, and breast cancer. And seven out of these um, cancers are um, either preventable through lifestyle modifications or there are screening or early or uh, there's a potential for early detection. So for instance, there are um, provincial screening programs for colorectal and breast cancer. Um, and there are uh, certain screening mod modalities for anal cancer. So now looking at cancers among males and females, so the top five cancers among females were breast, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, genital, lung, and thyroid. And when we looked at, um, just to see what, how they compare with the top five most common cancers in Canada and Ontario, we found that four out of the five were are, uh, also top five cancers among females in Canada and Ontario. Uh, and among males, we found that the top five were non-Hodgkin lymphoma, Kaposi sarcoma, prostate, lung, and anal cancer. And when comparing it, we found that uh, three out of the five were also top five most common cancers among males in Canada and Ontario. So what were the cancer trends over time? So here I'm showing a graph of the new cancer diagnoses over the study period. Uh, in the solid blue line, those are the cancers that we found in our study. So you can see that the overall trend is that cancers among people with HIV in Ontario is going down. Uh, the rate is decreasing. And underneath, um, we were wondering how that would compare with uh, cancers among the um, general population of Ontario and Canada. So those, the lines underneath are taken from the Ontario and the Canadian Cancer Statistics reports. And you can see that over time, um, they're pretty flat, so they're not going up or down. But it, it was interesting to see that um, it appears that can there are more new cancer diagnoses among people with HIV um, than, the, than the general population. So now we wanted to look more specifically and, and look at the difference between infection unrelated and infection related cancers. Um, 
and to see what was driving the downward, the decrease in overall cancer rate. So here you see um, the top blue line is again, the all cancers. And then the dash green line underneath is the uh, new infection unrelated cancers over time. And the orange line is, um, the dotted orange line is the new infection related cancers over time. And you can see again that all the cancer rates is going down for all cancers, but it also seems to be driven by the fact that infection related cancers are decreasing over time. So we wanted to dive deeply and see, um, look further into all infection related cancers and break it down. So we broke it down by AIDS defining and infection related non-AIDS defining. And so I'm in the dotted orange line, that's the line from the previous slide. It's all infection related cancers together. So that's AIDS defining and infection related non-AIDS defining grouped together. And then I'm splitting them up in the lines underneath. So you can see that in the solid orange line, that's AIDS defining cancers and there's um, a large decrease. And then in the um, brown dash line, that's the infection related non-AIDS defining cancers. And that seems to be stable uh, with a slight decrease in 2016, 2018. So we can see that what's driving the decrease in infection related cancers is really that large decrease in AIDS defining cancers over time. Um, so the main takeaways um, from my talk, uh, we found that the most common types of cancers diagnosed among people with HIV in Ontario seem to be quite similar to those found in the general population of, in Canada and in Ontario. We also saw that the seven of the top 10 cancers um, are either preventable um, through um, lifestyle modifications, like a decrease in use of tobacco and alcohol. Um, they're either, um, there is screening available such as breast, um, colorectal, um, and cervical cancer. Those are the three uh, provincial screening programs. There's also, um, or there, it's able, or it, um, there's the ability to detect the cancer early. Overall, we saw that there was a, a decrease in, can in new cancer diagnosis, um, and that was mainly driven by the large decrease in AIDS-defining cancer rates over time. We also saw that the rate of new cancers among people with HIV in Ontario appeared to be higher than the general population. Uh, but again, our next step in the, the next study is really to focus in on that question and um, to tease apart kind of if, if that is true or not by conducting um, a specific study to look at that. So some resources that are available. Um, of course, it's important to talk to your provider and engage in care. Um, you, it's important to talk to your provider about uh, cancer prevention options. So some, um, some options include most uh, perhaps there are smoking cessation programs, um, there's HPV vaccinations, uh, as I mentioned, there's the screening programs, but there's also other screening modalities for other types of cancer, such as anal cancer screening. So it's important to discuss these options with your provider. I also found a lot of uh, really interesting information online on the Canadian Cancer Society, which I'm going to show you. Um, so this is uh, a snapshot of the Canadian Cancer Society website. And I found a lot of really cool interactive tools on this website. So here we have uh, Discover It's My Life tool, and I'll go into that in a minute. Um, there's also a live chat box that you can chat with someone from the Canadian Cancer Society. So the It's My Life, it's a questionnaire um, type tool. And the questions they ask are about either lifestyle or behavior. So for instance, you spend a lot of your time sitting or um, 
so different types of activities, different diet um, and other lifestyle factors. And then in the end, um, it'll show you what are the modifiable cancer risk factors. And then um, it will ask you if there's one thing that you could choose um, to change, what would it be? So you could choose um, here, um, I will be safe in the sun or I will try to quit smoking. So it just um, giving you that kind of one thing that you could do to reduce cancer risk. There's also this really uh, interesting study that's called the COMPARE study. Um, and I have the um, website links at the top and I think Michael will be sharing the slides with you after. Um, so the COMPARE study is looking at um, estimating the number of cancer cases that could be reduced um, if you change certain lifestyle, environmental and um, other infectious risk factors. And this uh, COMPARE study has a lot of um, interesting data that you can play around with. So over here on the left, there are different menu options. And on the right, you could choose a different geography, um, sex, age, different age categories. Um, and this, this um, specific um, uh, web page will show you all the different risk factors that are um, attributable, that are um, a risk factor for any type of specific cancer. Um, and you can really zoom in on any kind of risk factor. So you can search any in risk factor you're interested in. So for example, I searched a human papillomavirus and then it shows you all of the cancers that have human papillomavirus as a risk factor. So for example, um, here in the blue, you can see that for cervical cancer, 100% of cases are attributable to HPV. Um, and then it also shows you the number of cases in Canada. So it's really um, very neat tools and um, yeah, just very interesting. And they also have really great infographics that look at, again, what proportion of um, cancer is preventable. Uh, so for instance, lung cancer, a lot of it is due to tobacco smoking and you can see all the other different types of cancers. And then they also have um, similar infographics for Ontario. So I'm not sure if I, I may have gone a little fast in my presentation. Um, that's all that I had for today, but I wanna open it up for discussion. So these two are uh, what is defined as AIDS-defining cancers. Um, so that classification is, is, yeah, so I'm gonna start kind of with the, with the classification. Um, so maybe I'll go, sorry. <laughs> um, I'll go to the beginning where I show the different definitions. Um, so this line. So this is a historical um, classification of cancers. It was developed by the, so AIDS defining cancers as a definition was developed by the Centers for Disease Prevention and Control in the United States as a way. So back um, very early in the AIDS um, epidemic, it was a way to classify um, and, and as a surveillance tool for any AIDS defining illness, um, if that makes sense. So these cancers were seen to be much more uh, common in individuals that had AIDS. So, so they use this definition to, as a way um, to, cat to classify any AIDS defining illness. So they in included these cancers. So, this isn't so much so relevant now um, because with ART, um, these cancers are much less common. But the reason that you see them come up in the top 10 most common is because we're looking at such a big um, study period. So that is a very good point 
uh, to raise and for I, I do plan on kind of looking at the most recent calendar period, like in the most recent years to see what are the most common cancers then. But because we're looking at such a long duration of time, so from 1997 um, to 2018, um, then those cancers come up as the most common. So they're still, they're AIDS defining cancers. Um, and and they, they do come up as, um, as our top two cancers. So the non-AIDS defining cancers are basically excluding the three AIDS defining cancers. So excluding cervical cancer, Kaposi sarcoma, and non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And I said that these are historical classifications because really cervical cancer, I mean, it's still, you know, is it an AIDS defining cancer? Or is it a not, you know, these are just kind of they were historical classifications and um, although we're trying to move away from these, uh, it's still, they still allow us to compare to what other studies have shown. But if we look at non-AIDS defining cancers, we can divide that into ones that are, have an infectious cause. Um, so we call those infection related non-AIDS defining cancers. Um, so what I mean by that is if there is a cause, if there's a virus that could cause this cancer, but it's not one of the three AIDS defining cancers, then we would put it in this box and the infection related non-AIDS defining cancers. So for instance, um, human papilloma virus or HPV, um, has been shown to cause anal cancer and also certain types of um, oral um, pharynx cancer. So those would be included as an infection related non-AIDS defining cancers. Um, then we have hepatitis B or hepatitis C virus, which can cause liver cancer. Um, we also have Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, which there's a virus called Epstein-Barr virus, which can cause Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, so all of those are kind of classified as infection related. So they, they have an infection agent that can cause the cancer, but they're not one of the three AIDS defining cancers. And then, so after we've classified those, then everything else that there's no science, um, there's no, not a, not, no conclusive evidence of an infectious agent causing this cancer, um, such as lung or breast cancer. Um, then we put that into, we classify those as infection unrelated non-AIDS defining cancers. So basically infection unrelated cancer. Yeah, they're all, because all of the AIDS defining cancers have an infectious agent that can cause it. Maybe you want to go to the uh, the slide where you list the top um, cancers for men. I, th I think this um, person was particularly interested yeah. yes, there. So yeah, so um, so in this um, so the first two for men are AIDS defining. So they they are classified historically as AIDS defining. Um, and as I mentioned, it's most likely because it's such a long study period and most of the AIDS defining cancers that we found were diagnosed in the early period, like in 1997, 2000 period. Um, so I do wanna take this and kind of look at what are the most common cancers in the more recent um, study period. So those results will come um, once I get to analyzing them again. Um, and then we have prostate cancer, which this wouldn't have an infectious. So there's no research that shows that this has an infectious agent causing um, prostate. Uh, same with lung cancer. And then anal cancer is um, a human papilloma virus is a virus that can cause anal cancer. So that would be classified as infection related, but a non AIDS defining cancer. So these two cancers, um, they're very rare and they norm typically occur when you have a law, low immune function for an extended period of time. Um, so yeah, so I, 
there isn't a, an early detection um, that um, like a way to, to detect, detect it early or to screen for, for it, but uh, there's very low likelihood of having this cancer because, um, because people are now on antiretroviral therapy and their immune function is good. And, and so these cancers in the later, um, in like the more, more recent years, they don't come up as much. So I'm sorry, I didn't mean this slide to be <laughs> distressing. Um, so I, I should have probably looked at the most common cancers in like the earliest period. Um, but we had all of this um, data over the whole kind of 20 year period. So we just looked at overall over the 20 years. So we have, we've got a couple more questions that I want to, I want to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to ask. Um, so in the chat function, we did have a request to show the HIV infection specific uh, to women picture. I believe this might be the slide that you're referring to. Uh, if not, please just mention in the chat which one you would like um, our guest speakers to revisit. Uh, and we can do that. Um, lots of comments about how great this presentation is. Um, so we have a couple Thank of questions you. that have been asked. Um, that I want to get to. So the first one, I'm going to plop in the chat function um, so that it's easier for our presenters to reference. Um, but I will read it out as well. Sorry, just one second. So one of our attendees has asked, I lost my mother to breast cancer. Sorry to hear that. I've also lost a cousin to the same and another who got diagnosed with breast cancer. As a person living with HIV, do I have an increased chance of any kind of cancer? If your study did not explore this, can you say why? So I'm really sorry to hear about um, the losses. Um, and yes, thank you for, for bringing up that question about exploring the difference in risk. Um, that is actually what my next step in the study would be to look at um, comparing uh, cancer risk among people with and without HIV uh, to really to look at, at if there is whether there is an increased risk. Um, so there has been other studies from other parts of the world that um, have shown an increase in risk, but um, we don't know for Ontario specifically. So that is something that I will be looking at next. Okay, great. And we have another question. If I take HPV, if I take the HPV vaccination at the age of 55 as a person living with HIV, are there any studies or data that suggest that I am reducing my chance of getting anal cancer? My doctor at TGH has not been able to give me a clear answer on this. Am I better off taking the three-shot vaccine and hoping for the best? Your physician probably can't give you a clear answer because there probably isn't a clear answer in the literature and or um, any kind of clear recommendation from policy. And I know there is also a um, cost associated with HPV vaccination, so that's why it's hard for um, it's just hard if there's not that really clear scientific evidence to just have like a yes, no type of answer. Um, maybe, maybe I might pipe in here, Iwana. I just, I just want to say that if you're, if you do have concerns about um, anal cancer, the best thing uh, for you to do aside, I, I mean, I think I personally think it's a benefit to have the vaccination, even at a <clears throat> Uh, even at uh, you know an age that's older than 45, but I um, uh, I think that um, uh, because it it might reduce the risk of it uh, coming or coming back if you've had uh, precancers that have been treated already. Um, but the best thing that you can do is to be involved in some kind of regular screening program, likely with your family doctor, because there is technically no anal cancer screening program in Ontario, aside from those that are supported through research funds, which mean if you don't fit into their research category, you might have difficult accessing it. Um, 
so um, talk to your family doctor about at least doing an annual uh, anal digital exam where uh, your doctor will uh, feel for any unusual uh, bumps or lumps in the anal canal. It's, uh, it's not necessarily uh, a pleasant exam um, and uh, you, you would probably uh, want to have a good relationship with your doctor, um, but it is something that um, all of, uh, all of um, people, all of the people living with HIV should, um, sh should uh, try to do with their family doctors on an annual basis. So it's not, again, it's not a, a, a total answer to your question, but uh, please do um, uh, speak with your doctor about that. Um, so we do have another question that was in the chat. Um, this is from Christian and they say, thank you very much for your presentation. I am wondering if um, you or your team intended to explore how various social demographic characteristics, example, sexual orientation, social economic status, uh, social deprivation, et cetera, may serve as drivers to specific forms of cancer amongst your sample. That is a good question. Um, we haven't, um, I guess we haven't, because we're still in the beginning stages of the study, um, we don't currently have that type of uh, individual level data, uh, but we're hoping in the future to be able to use um, cohorts that are linked um, with kind of these uh, medical chart and more administrative data to be able to look um, at that. But yeah, that is a very good point and definitely something interesting to look into. Um, the data that we have now is kind of very general. It's not um, not very specific at all, just, yeah. But um, definitely something to explore later on. Thanks, Christian. Um, so we have a comment here. It says, I know this was the first scan of the statistics on HIV and cancer in Ontario, um, but I'm hoping we can get more information in the future, uh, mm -hmm. specifically the risk level for different cancers among PJs. Yeah. Um, so it's definitely something that I wanted to look at, to look at um, site like specific cancers and see kind of the cancer trends. Uh, but when we got to that kind of level, um, there were very few numbers, so we couldn't show them, um, especially when you're looking at a 20 year period, um, which is why we kind of had to aggregate them into these larger groups. Um, but I'm hoping to be able to do that in my next studies, as, uh, especially, when in, in the next one, when I'm comparing people with and without HIV, I'm hoping to be able to have enough number of cancers to look at specific, like maybe the most common three um, cancers and see kind of what the risk is. Um, so I have one more question in the chat field. Um, it says, my question, uh, my first question is, was there any particular reason why the study was uh, done between 1997 and 2018. Uh, the graphs that you just showed, would someone be able to input their own personal data so that they could find out their potential chances of getting cancer? So the first question, um, that 20 year period was the data that we had available. Uh, we have a new update of data up to 2020. Um, so, I'm in the process of reanalyzing up to 2020. Actually, I haven't started yet, but I have to start analyzing. Um, but that was the most, basically the most number of years that we could get was starting from 1997 to 2018. And part of it is because the algorithm uh, that was used to develop um, or to identify people with HIV in these um, secondary databases. That's when it started identifying is starting with 1997. Um, so we just, we took all of the data that we could. Oh, and the second question is, um, I don't think that's a possibility of finding um, 
your specific risk of cancer, but um, I think those other uh, resources that I shared with you might be able to give you a better idea. Um, like just answering the questionnaire uh, of It's My Life uh, website, the tool, um, and also looking at um, some of the compare study statistics where you can manipulate. So unfortunately, um, yeah, there's, there's a limited kind of manipulation with the, the data that we have. Again, for like security reasons and, um, and because there are such like aggregate level data that I don't think you would get a, a, a right answer if you were looking at individual specific risk. Like it, it would be hard to input your own risk factors. The resource that you shared from the Canadian Cancer Society, though, I mean, that's amazing. I, I haven't I, I haven't been on their website in, in a very long time, and I had no idea that it um, was so dynamic and uh, involved. Yeah, www.cancer.ca. So you can visit their website. And then also, I'm going to share the slides right after we yeah. finish here with everyone who RSVP'd. Um, and so that information will also be contained in the slides. But yeah, that was fantastic. I definitely was like squinting my eyes and looking at all the uh, behaviors and risk factors that uh, were listed and, and doing the mental calculations of how uh, at risk I was based on my own behaviors. So that was really uh, it was a great resource. I'm going to revisit it and look myself. Um, so we, we are out of time. I don't think there's any more questions. No one else has raised their hand. So I think we're going to end it there. Uh, thank you to our presenters. Joanne, Niwana, thank you very much for your time and your energy and for the work that you put into this study and for sharing it with us. I hope you will come back and uh, continue to talk to us about this important issue. Um, yes, I want to thank, thank our, you. Um, I want to thank our sponsors as well. One last time, Viv, Gilead, Merck, and the Village Pharmacy. Thank you so much for your support. Um, did anyone have any final thoughts? Anything they wanted to, a note they wanted to end on? Joanne, thank, you you Michael, for, thank you, Michael, for making this space available to us. It's a, it's a wonderful uh, way to speak with uh, people in our community. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Someone says, I really miss seeing everyone in person. I do too. I miss it so much, you guys. I hate that we're sort of stuck in this uh, Zoom uh, uh, universe. Um, someone saying, hello. Hello, Joanne. I'm not going to say your name, but someone in the chat is saying hello to you. Uh, and thank you for being here to present. Really appreciate it. All right. Well, I think we're going to call it an evening. Thank you, everyone. Um, this presentation, like I said, will be edited and posted online in the next couple of months. And we'll be sure to let you know. So please follow us online at uh, www.actoronto.com. Uh, or, or follow us on our social medias for the latest updates. You'll see those videos posted on there soon. Uh, so thank you everyone. Bye.